Well, last time a question came up, a very important question, and we didn't deal with it at all. The question was, what about light in Genesis? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought maybe, I thought maybe we better deal with it because there is more in what was happening right there than I think we've been able to talk about. And I haven't read a lot in, in the books that deal with it, so we're going to look at it today. We know that it starts by saying, in the beginning, God. And whatever that beginning is, God doesn't have a beginning. See? So all it's saying is, wherever you want to go, and you call it beginning, he's already there. <laughs> okay? So God is infinite. And Jesus, we, we mentioned this, I think, last time, I'm not sure. When he said, I am, that's what he was saying. Wherever you want to go for the beginning, I don't care. Where are you going? You call it the beginning. I'm there. <laughs> so Jesus, in John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. So Jesus is divine, and that means a lot of things. All right, so in Genesis, then, it says that God was dealing with a mass of material that he had made, and it was without form. Okay, so here's, now we're not going to get into the science of it, the, the, the wave Generator, the, the things that were going on there, we want to talk about light today. But God had already done something before he said, let there be light. See, He had he'd already started something, but he couldn't go any further until he said, let there be light. And then there was light. And it says he divided the light from the darkness. So that's the first thing we want to understand. What is darkness? Because that was there first. <laughs> see? Do you see that? The darkness was there first. So what is darkness? Well, darkness, the dark, is not a thing. You can't make dark. <laughs> that's why God said let there be light because it was already dark why was there dark it's because there was no light <laughs> darkness is the absence of light now we can prove that very easily try sometime to get a little bit of darkness and put it in the light. <laughs> I mean, your mind can't even get a hold of that. You can't be done. There's no such thing as darkness that you can put in light. But you can take light and put it in the darkness. That's a whole different thing. So light is something, and darkness is not. So that's the first thing we want to see about Genesis the first chapter, when, when God is going to create, he's creating out of something that is nothing. Now, I don't know why our scientists get tripped over and say, no, he started with something there and he just put form to it. No. Darkness means there was nothing there and then... He made the blobs, and he calls it waters. It says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, I don't want to start a debate here, but the Bible says the Spirit of God. It doesn't say anything else. It was God. <laughs> okay? Now, is Jesus God? Okay. So the Father 
through mysterious agencies we don't understand and he has not explained, was working through the Son. And the Bible says the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. So it was Jesus who was moving on the face of the waters. He's the creator. He's the agency from the Father. Now, that should be pretty clear because that's what it says in John 1, that Jesus made all things. Colossians 1 says he made all things. Hebrews 1 says he made all things. It's clear in the Bible. Jesus is the one who did it. <laughs> but the Genesis says it was the Spirit of God. So whatever that Spirit of God is, it's Jesus. <laughs> All right, so that's the first thing we need to understand here. All right. I would like to read now something from Volume 8 of the Testimonies. 255. Before the entrance of sin, not a cloud rested upon the minds of our first parents to obscure their perception of the character of God. They were perfectly conformed to the will of God. Now, these sentences really go by fast, but there's a couple of things we should notice before we move on here. They could see God clearly and not misunderstand his character because they were conformed to his will. There's a secret there. If we want to understand the character of God, we must be conformed to his will. If we're not, we're going to get all confused. All right. For a covering of a beautiful light, the light of God surrounded them. Now, we are used to having that in our mind, that Adam and Eve had a robe of light, but we haven't stopped to think, well, what is that? <laughs> well, the sentence just told us, the light that surrounded them, it just wasn't on top of them, it surrounded them, that light was the presence of of God. See? Now, how close is that? <laughs> they could understand who God was because God was their light. This clear and perfect light illuminated everything everything they approached. Let that soak in. Let that really soak in. Adam and Eve are surrounded with the presence of God, the light, and wherever they went, here's a tree, wherever they went, the light hit that tree and they knew all about the tree. Why? Because the light was God, and what God knew, they knew. <laughs> so they're, they're walking around, they see an animal, the light hits that animal, they know the animal. They hit the leaves, the water, the grass, wherever they went, the light went there first. <laughs> and that's how they were living their life. Wherever they went, the light, the light, the presence of God was revealing to them what they were looking at. All right, so let's hold the thought. Nature was their lesson book. In the Garden of Eden, the existence of God was demonstrated. So do you see why Seventh-day Adventists are supposed to get out in nature on the Sabbath? Nature reveals who God is. But there's a problem. He 
His attributes were revealed in the objects of nature that surrounded them. Everything upon which their eyes rested spoke to them. Everything. The invisible things of God, even His everlasting power in divinity, were clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made. So creation, seen through the light, reveals who God is. Well, what is the problem? If they hadn't sinned, they would have continued to see God through his works. Okay, I'm quoting now. But when they listened to the tempter and sinned against God, the light of the garments of heavenly innocence departed from them. Deprived of the heavenly light, they could no longer discern the character of God and the works of his hand. So, when people walk around today and they look at nature, what do they see? Well, they don't see God. <laughs> when a scientist walks around looking at nature, what does he see? Evolution. <laughs> he sees cruelty. He sees brutality. And if he gets anything from nature about God, he says, man, that's a pretty horrible God. <laughs> Why? Because he doesn't have any light. He has seen only darkness. But there's another problem. Through man's disobedience, a change was wrought in nature itself. Marred by the curse of sin, nature can bear but an imperfect testimony regarding the Creator. It cannot reveal His character in its perfection. All right. So now we see what Genesis 1 was telling us, God said, let there be light. There was light. Adam and Eve had that light until they sinned, and then they were in darkness. And that's all they could pass on was darkness. And I don't know about you, but that tells me the whole human race has the problem. <laughs> there are no innocent ones. The whole human race had the problem. So where are we now? The whole world is in darkness from Adam and Eve on. The Bible calls it spiritual night. Human race is in spiritual night. John 1, 9. John 1, 9 says he is the true light. Jesus is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus, in Genesis 1, was the light. He's the true light. Now that's an interesting comment, that he is the true light. Because what do we think is the light? 
wandering around every day. What do we think it is? Hmm. <laughs> the sun. <laughs> That's the only light we know about. <laughs> But John, talking to us spiritually, says, get your eyes off of the sun because that's only a reflector. Now, now at this point, the scientists would go crazy and say, no, it generates its own light. That's not what we're talking about. Where did the sun get its light? <laughs> From Jesus, because Jesus is the true light. <laughs> so we don't need the sun in Genesis, the first chapter, in those first few verses, because Jesus is the true light. On the fourth day, he makes the sun, which will reflect his light. <laughs> We have to get a hold of these thoughts the way the Bible's saying them. Otherwise, we'll be like everybody else wondering, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? Well, the Bible's telling us. Jesus is the true light. <laughs> but there's something else hiding in this verse. That lighteth every man. Uh-oh. That's not the way we're used to thinking of it. You mean those Jehovah's Witnesses? Yes. <laughs> You mean, yes. We must not think of people who don't know Jesus the way we have been informed through the Spirit. We mustn't think that he's not there too. He is. He is concerned about every human being. And he has paid the ultimate price for every human being. And we are supposed to be in the position of loving Jesus so much that we love those people the way he does. And we can't think evil thoughts about them. We just want them saved. <laughs> okay. So it goes together. He is the true light that lights every man. Fantastic thing there. All right. Over in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Paul talks about the light of the knowledge. Okay? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God. And he tells us how it's revealed. In the face of Jesus Christ. When we have Jesus, that reveals to us the glory, the character of God. So Jesus is our light. Now, now let's go back to Adam and Eve. They lost the light because they weren't innocent anymore. But according to the word, Jesus is restoring us in the light. He's bringing that light back to us. What did it do for Adam and Eve? Everything they looked at through that light, they understood. And that's what God is trying to bring back to us. The understanding of everything he knows, the way he knows it, through the light. Through Jesus. So the more we have of Jesus, the more we will see and understand what God has done. <laughs> but we can't do it without the light. <laughs> and I think that's what a lot of people are trying to do. They're trying to reason it out. <laughs> yeah. And I know people who say, you know, I can't do this until I see what it's all about. Well, you know what that means. They're never going to do it because God's not going to show them everything. He can't give them light until they start walking in it. 
So there are several things going on here. When we tell people about obedience and surrender and all this, I think we're not helping them because they're saying, okay, I can do that. <laughs> no, they can't. <laughs> That's the part we're not telling them. Yeah, when somebody says to you in all sincerity, I will walk with God. You better tell them you can't until you do something else. <laughs> the light is what we need. Now, what is the light? Let's get it clear in our minds so we can talk to people about these things. The light is the symbol of the presence of God. Without God, nothing happens. In the sanctuary, what was the symbol of the presence of God? <laughs> the Shekinah of uh, the ark there, the light. Anywhere you look at the Bible, you're going to find it. When the presence, when the children of Israel are out in the wilderness, it turned dark. What was the symbol of God protecting them? The pillar of fire, the light. When, when uh, Pharaoh and his troops were chasing them and they had them surrounded on three sides and all that was in front of them was water, Pharaoh said, oh, we have them now. That's a pretty dumb general. <laughs> uh, they came up against them. What happened? A cloud. A big cloud came down, and on their side, it was dark. But on the side where the Hebrews were, it was light. <laughs> and that's the way it stayed, because God had to get almost two million of those Hebrews across that water, and it didn't happen in two hours. <laughs> the whole time, the light was there, showing them the way, protecting them. And of course, in the desert, the cloud in the daytime shielded them from the sun, kept them nice and cool, and then at night, the pillar, so they could see what they were doing, <laughs> keeping them warm if they had to be. So the light is always a symbol of the presence of God, but he actually is there. So in Genesis 1, let there be light, let Jesus be known here in the creation. And the one who didn't want to know that was Satan because he, he said, I can do everything Jesus can do. <laughs> well, he found out there was something he couldn't do right there. <laughs> All right, so light then becomes a very important thing here, and it only, only comes through Jesus. There is no other way. This is why every other religion in the world doesn't cut it now. They don't like to hear that. <laughs> but I don't know of any of their leaders or prophets who said they were better than the sunshine. <laughs> All right, just a couple more statements here. Then I want to go to one of the feasts of Israel that teach us about these things. All right, quoting again, 256, I think it is. The things of nature upon which we look today give us but a faint conception of Eden's beauty and glory, yet much that is beautiful remains. Nature testifies that one infinite in power great in goodness, mercy, and love, created the earth and filled it with life and gladness. Even in their blighted state, all things reveal the handiwork of the great master artist. Through, though sin has marred the form and beauty of the things of nature, though on them may be seen, tr through them, Things may be seen, traces of the work of the prince of the power of the air. So we can, we can see two things happening there. We can see God, but we can see something evil there too. Yet they still speak of God. In the briars, the 
thistles, the thorns, the tares. We may read the law of condemnation. But from the beauty of natural things and from their wonderful adaptation to our needs and our happiness, we may learn that God still loves us and that his mercy is yet manifested in the world. In Steps to Christ, she says a little more clearly, she talks about the flowers, the beautiful flowers that God left for us. He didn't have to leave those. <laughs> the songs of the little birds. He didn't have to leave those either. But all these things tell us that he loves us and he wants us to enjoy beauty too. All right. I would like to talk to you a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles. Now the Feast of Tabernacles was the seventh feast, the last one of the year. And it came just a few days after the Day of Atonement. Okay. The Day of Atonement was the first day 10. There was 10 days there of the trumpets, then day 10 for the atonement. And then on the 15th day was the tabernacles. And the tabernacle feast was seven days. You will hear people saying it was eight days, but it wasn't eight days. The eighth day was an extra day. The Feast of Tabernacles was, was over in seven days. And the eighth day was a convocation. It was a day of worship. It was called a Sabbath, according to Leviticus 23. So let's keep that straight biblically. Seven days of tabernacles, an extra day called the Sabbath. Because it will become important here soon. In the year that Jesus went there, things had already been happening, and his brothers, the sons of Joseph, were really upset with him. <laughs> I said, you know, you're... You're really making a bad name for yourself. It doesn't seem to matter what those leaders say. You're always on the other side of things. <laughs> and it doesn't look good. <laughs> what are you doing? Criticizing those people <laughs> by the way you live. Well, he wasn't going to get into an argument with them. They said, look, this is a good time to try to patch things up. Let's go to the Feast of Tabernacles. We've all been commanded to go there. And he says, my hour has not come. <laughs> they said, there you go again. <laughs> They're going to think you're avoiding them. Come on, let's go over there. He said, no, you go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead. And so they went off in a hut. <laughs> and they said, boy... He just doesn't know how to cooperate. He doesn't know. Leave him alone. So they went. Well, Jesus didn't want to set up something with the crowds. That's why he didn't want to go with them because he, was, he didn't want to prejudice them any more than they had to be. They were already in a terrible condition. So... He had already decided to go, but he was going to go quietly so nobody would know he was going. So that's what he did. He, uh, he went through the back roads, and he went where there weren't people. And he didn't talk to anybody. He just And finally, according to John, in the midst of the feast, which scholars take to mean in the middle day, which would be the fourth day or the third day, whatever, however you're looking at it, I'm not sure that's exactly what it means, but that's all right. In the midst, he, it had already started. <laughs> and so he went there, and then he did a most interesting thing. He went into the middle of the courtyard where all the people were. And that's the position he took up, in the center of everything. <laughs> now, for a person that didn't want to know anybody, he was there. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> there he is. And he began to teach. Now, the Pharisees, the teachers of that day, the scribes and so forth, 
they had a particular way of teaching. They, they were big shots. And there are preachers today that try to do that. You know, oh, blah, blah. No. When Jesus began to teach, he taught very deliberately, quietly, slowly. And when he talked, he didn't give his opinions and he didn't quote people. It is written, Bible, thus saith the Lord. And then he would say things about the scriptures they never heard before, just the way he was saying it. And they, it just absolutely captivated them. <laughs> Here's a man who knew what he was talking about. <laughs> And it made sense, and it was good to hear it. Yeah. And so they were listening to Jesus, and of course the, the leaders had already made up their mind they wanted to kill him. They, they made up their mind when Lazarus was raised from the dead. They said, a person who can do that's dangerous. We have to kill him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Isn't that a, what a strange thing for people to do? And then they thought about it. They said, you know, we can't have Lazarus wandering around either. You have to kill him again. <laughs> so they had already made up their mind what they had to do with Jesus, but they couldn't do it in front of the people. So they said, we'll have to set something up. We'll have to get him all by himself, and then we'll take care of it. What well, Jesus was there teaching, and the people were listening, and there was nobody who could do anything with him because what he was saying is just, they just weren't used to it. <laughs> well, what at night, every night there were two big pillars that they used as lampstands. And every night they would light those up with a ceremony. And then they would light the other lamps all around and it would light up all of Jerusalem. So it was, there was no dark during the Feast of Tabernacles. The people were happy because they had gotten past the Day of Atonement. <laughs> they said, oh, we're the people of God. <laughs> it was harvest time. They were there in thanksgiving spirit. And they did an interesting thing. Because they were celebrating the time in the wilderness, they didn't live in the houses. They all came outside to live in booths. And since there weren't a lot of booths sitting around all over the place, they'd go to the forests around, and they would pick up the, the most beautiful parts of the forest, the trees and whatever, bushes and, and uh, flowers, whatever, and they'd bring it in there, and they would make these booths. They'd set it up on top of the roofs and everything and made the city look like a beautiful forest. <laughs> it was all natural. <coughs> So this is really a beautiful time in Jerusalem. And every night, the, the priests would start singing. They're singing their songs of praise. They would begin chanting certain scriptures. And the people would sing with them. And they were just there having a good time. Feast of Tabernacles was a time of joy. And for some of your friends who say we're supposed to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, I just want to mention that prophets and kings, she says in quoting all of this that it would be well for us as a people to have a Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I don't believe she was saying to keep the feast because you can't do it outside of Jerusalem. What she was saying was, why don't we have a time of joy and thanksgiving? Why don't we sing to God? Why don't we get together to praise Him? <laughs> See? I think that's what she was saying. <laughs> All right, so anyhow, this took place every night, this illumination. And what the Jews got out of that was the Messiah is going to come. And he will teach us. He will illuminate us himself. Israel. Okay. You hold on to that thought. Because Jesus had to deal with that thought. And so each night this would happen. In the daytime, he would teach. The Pharisees were all upset. The leadership, the Sadducees, and so forth were trying to figure out what they were going to do with him. 
during this time, Mary, uh, well, she's not called that. The, the woman caught in adultery was put in front of him. They, they figured, we'll get him. We'll get him to say he's the anointed one. If we can get him to say that, and then we can get him to go against Moses or to go against the Romans. It doesn't matter which one. We've got him. <laughs> and so they put the woman there. And of course, the spirit of prophecy says the men who brought her and said, look at this woman. They're the ones that led her into sin. And so they did this to her so that they'd have something to test Jesus on. <laughs> and when they brought her, they said, look at this. Look at this. Moses said, stunner, what do you say? <laughs> And Jesus looked around. He surveyed the situation and understood. You see, he being the light can see. Have, have you ever wondered how come he knew things all the time? <laughs> he was the light. <laughs> when you have the light, you can see. <laughs> and so he didn't talk to them. He didn't say a thing. We know what he did. He just bent down and there was... Something there he could work with. He started writing. Now, I don't know why people think Jesus couldn't write because it says right there he did. <laughs> He's writing. <laughs> and of course, they're getting upset and they say, well, What are you doing? Answer the question. And so the first person that came over was one of them who had just done this to her so that he, he, they'd have something to say to Jesus. And the man looked over there. Hmm. <laughs> he wrote my name and he said, look what you did. <laughs> and so he kind of backed up a little bit. <laughs> and Jesus, he, he wrote another one and it happened to be the name of the next fellow who came up <laughs> and looked over and said, what is this? And he saw it, his sins. He got quiet pretty fast, too. And one at a time, they all faded away. He didn't say very much. And Jesus said, he who has no sin, you, you throw the first stone. And they were all gone. <laughs> all of them. And you know how Mary... Related to that, when he said, the one of you who is without sin, you throw the first stone? She said, oh, no, I've had it now. Yeah, she said, I'm done. I'm dead. And nothing happened. <laughs> and Jesus stopped, and he looked around. and said, oh, where are they? Where, where are your accusers? She said, they're all gone. <laughs> No stones. He said, well, neither do I condemn you. Now, he could have, couldn't he? <laughs> yeah, he could have thrown the first stone. But he didn't do it. We need to remember that. Jesus is not in the stoning business. He said, I, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, just go. <laughs> you see, there are conditions to the gospel. He said, go and sin no more. <laughs> well, that's another story. We don't want to get too far into that. But this is all going on during this week. And Jesus, on the last day of the feast, came out in the morning, and the priests were doing their thing. On that particular day, they did a ceremony about the wilderness and the rock that was smitten and Israel being supplied with water. That's what they did that morning. Every year, that morning, that's what they did. So Jesus, on that day, in the morning, after they had done this, he says, let him who is a thirst, 
come unto me. Now we all hear that come unto me, but what did he say when he said that? He said, I am the rock. I am where the water comes from. But it won't come out until I am smitten. So he said to the people, I am the smitten one. <laughs> That's what he's saying. And of course, they understood these things that we're not picking up <laughs> because they just saw the ceremony. <laughs> and they knew what he said. You are going to be smitten. <laughs> then the waters come out. And then we have salvation. And they understood. They understood salvation is only in Jesus. Yes, there were people there who understood. And they were happy. I said, nobody ever told us this before. <laughs> you know, the officers of the land uh, were paid by the religious ones to go over there and get Jesus and bring him all the people. They weren't getting to this. They said, come on, you go get him. <laughs> we can't have this anymore. Go get him for us. So they said, okay, we'll go get him. So they went over there and they heard Jesus talking and they started listening. <laughs> Bad mistake. <laughs> because after they were listening for a while, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's something. Oh, oh. <laughs> and finally they realized, we came over here to get him. <laughs> they said, well, we can't do that. So they went back to the priests. And they said, well, where is he? <laughs> well, we, we didn't do it. They said, what's the matter with you? We paid you. How come you didn't do it? And they thought about it. <laughs> what are we going to say? What are we going to say? And finally, they just had to say it. No man ever spoke like this man. <laughs> yeah, that's what they said. They could not deny. He's so different. No one, we've never heard anything like this. The next morning, now remember, the feast is over now. You're not going to read this in the commentaries because most of the geniuses of this world say the next events happen about a month later. But no, this was the next day after the feast, which was the Sabbath of the feast. It was not the seventh day Sabbath. That's what we say. But that's not what happened. And I'll show you why. It was the Sabbath of the feast. It was the eighth day. On that day, I know it because here's what happened. Jesus, the people's attention is on. I mean, they've been listening to him and they, they know this is something the priests don't know anything about. <laughs> They're not like him. <laughs> Jesus walking in the midst of the people. Multitudes watching him. He paused for a moment and then he pointed to the sun. He said, I am the light. <laughs> not that sun. <laughs> See, now we're ready for it because we talked about it here a little bit. But they were not ready for it. <laughs> Nobody prepared them. <laughs> and this man that came from Galilee, <laughs> that little town, Nazareth, our carpenter's son, he says, I am the light. 
Now, why did he say that? You see, we need to get behind the stories. We have already established that they had those two pillars of light every night. And that was a symbol of the Messiah coming to Israel. But Jesus, standing in front of all of them, said, no, no, no. Those two lights are not telling you enough. I'm not coming for Israel only. I am the light of the world. <laughs> well, that was a whole new thought to them. <laughs> but it shouldn't be a whole new thought to us. The light and the life of every man. <laughs> now, you just can imagine what the religious leaders of his day must have been doing when he said that. I am the light of the world. <laughs> I mean, what do you do with a statement like that? <laughs> I mean, if one of us here stood up and went down to the corner and said, I am the light of the world, they'd call you out to loony bin somebody. <laughs> And rightfully so. <laughs> but Jesus said it. And their, their jaws just popped open. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do. Second Peter one nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. See? Well, what's a day star? For a long time I didn't know what a day star was. It was too obvious for me. I tried to make something... <laughs> Big it, just, it just means a star you can see in the daytime. <laughs> the sun. <laughs> it's a day star. <laughs> and in the morning, how much of it do you see? Yeah, see, it's just very dim. And the dawning comes and it gets brighter and brighter until it's at full zenith. Well, that's how Jesus comes to us. It's very dim in the beginning. We just see little bits. But it keeps growing and growing, and he wants to get us, so we see the full blaze of it. That's what Peter is saying there. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 1, 4, in him was life, and the light, life was the light of men. He that falleth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus said it in front of everybody, and no one could deny it anymore. He said, I'm the Messiah. In front of all those people, they knew exactly what he meant. He declared himself, to be the Messiah. Isaiah 49, 6, for your notes. It is too light a thing that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So there's Isaiah telling us the gospel and, of course, he's known as the gospel prophet. And so these people, as upset as they were, said, What are you saying? 
Who do you think you are? Who are you? <laughs> That's what they said. Who are you? And Jesus just looked at them and said, I've been telling you all along. <laughs> the same as I said from the beginning. <laughs> What's the big secret here? <laughs> Now, he moved in on them a little bit here, and I want to get to this before we get through here today. He moved in on them and began to talk to them why they didn't know who he was. He's going to explain it to them. They obviously did not have the light, and there was a reason they didn't have the light. It's because light only comes to the people who love the light who love truth. And he said, you know, if when you come to it, when you let the light come to you and do what it's supposed to do, you'll be free. And he was so happy to tell them that, how to be free. And of course, they were theologians. So they said, what do you mean, free? We never have been slaves. <laughs> of course, they forgot about the Babylonians. They forgot about the Romans. They forgot about... <laughs> of course, they were speaking spiritually, see. Everybody's got a trick. <laughs> Watch out for those tricks. That's what we know who our father is. Abraham. Abraham. And we know what Jesus is going to do with that. <laughs> he said, you're trying to kill me. I said, what? <laughs> what kind of a devil do you have? Who's trying to kill you? <laughs> and that terrorized them that he knew their plan. <laughs> it really did. They didn't know what to do with it now. He knows. How does he know? <laughs> I said, now, my father and your father are two different people. I love my father, and my father loves me. If you loved my father, you would love me too. But he is not your father. You do what your father does. Your father is evil. He does evil things. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. Your father's the devil. <laughs> Say that to a general conference president sometime. It doesn't go too well, does it? Jesus was telling the religionists of his church. You're in the dark. You don't have the light. Jesus is the light. Genesis 1. When you have the light, you can see. Now, because we're running out of time, I've got to move into some things here quickly. They picked up stones to kill him. Now, I don't know whether they got stones in the courtyard. <laughs> they were still rebuilding. Maybe they got some of the stuff that was laying around there. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us, but they were going to stone him. This is a very interesting thing to me. Jesus, at that moment, did something that a lot of people say he couldn't do because he was just like us. He hid himself. Yes, right. That's right. And I'd like to see you do that sometime. <laughs> he hid himself. It doesn't say the angels hid him. He hid himself. He did it. He did something. What did he do? Now, get this. 
when he finished talking to them, they said, Are we blind too? We'll get to the story later. But Jesus blinded them to prove who they were. They couldn't see him anymore. Isn't that something? Supernaturally, he did something so they couldn't see him to prove they were blind. Now, how do I know that Sabbath was the eighth day? Because the very next thing in Scripture, chapter 9 of John says, as he was walking... He came across a blind man. What? The light of the world comes across a blind man? <laughs> it's a direct hook to what just happened with all of those religious leaders. The religious leaders are blind, but say they see. And here's a blind man I can't see. <laughs> And so Jesus talked to him a little bit. He'd been blind from birth. This was really blind. <laughs> okay. And so Jesus took some clay. He spit into it. Now people don't generally get into why did he do that. But one of the reasons that we can find historically is the Jews did not consider that to be breaking the Sabbath. So Jesus did something that would be okay with them. <laughs> he made the clay and puts... Now, he didn't need it and make a big potion out of it. He just put the spit and made it together. And then he put it on the man's eyes. Now, that was against the Sabbath. He was anointing. That's work. <laughs> so he, anointed him. he told him to go down to that pool over there and, and wash his face. And he'll be able to see. The, the, the name of the pool was, was sent. That's the name of the pool. Jesus sent him over there. So the man went over there, and, and he could see. <laughs> and he jumped up and down. He said, I can see. I can see. And so who did he get to look at? The Pharisees. <laughs> Isn't that a great first thing to see? <laughs> <laughs> These ugly faces frowning at him. <laughs> and they said, what are you doing? You ignorant person, what are you doing? You're stirring people up. What are you saying? <laughs> he said, well, I can see. He said, well, what did he do to you? Well, he put some, <laughs> he told me to go over the pool. I can see. I said, you let that sinner do that to you? <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, people are calling him this and calling him that, but nothing good ever came out of that place. <laughs> and there's nothing in the Bible that says a prophet would ever come out of there. They knew he wasn't from there. <laughs> they were going to do that anyhow. I'll twist the scripture just a little bit. Well, this poor man, they're trying to get him all confused, and they were getting there. I'm going to buy so much good stuff. Well, you're going to have to go over there and read for yourself. Desire of Ages. The light of life, that chapter, read it carefully. Every sentence is full of things. All right, so the man is telling them he's this, so they're saying, no, you just look like that man. <laughs> You're not him. <laughs> and that got into thinking, you know, well, what are you saying to me? They said, it's me, I'm him. <laughs> and they, they said, no, you're not him. <laughs> I mean, how stubborn can you get? <laughs> the 
the man's telling him it's him. <laughs> I said, forget it. We don't want to talk to you anymore. Get his parents over here. <laughs> Brought the parents in. I said, we want to know if this is your son. Yeah, that's our son. Was he blind? Yeah, he was born blind. Well, how come he says he sees now? <laughs> who did this? So we don't know who did this. You see, because if they said they knew who it was, they put him out of the synagogue for 60 to 90 days. They didn't want to run a foul of these priests. So they said, no, we're not going to talk anymore here. They said, well, was he healed? I mean, what, what is this? They said, well, you have to ask him. He's of age. Ask him. <laughs> so they got off the hook, and they brought him back in again. They said, now we want to get the truth out of you. What is going on here? Now, these, these Pharisees did not understand what was going on because this man was not by himself. The angels were helping him. They were putting thoughts into his mind. They were giving him words to use that these Pharisees could not get around. Jesus was, was giving him help. <laughs> they didn't know they were facing heavenly agencies in this man. Now, this man was not a Christian yet. He doesn't even know who Jesus is. The only thing he knows is a man, let him see. He has light, <laughs> but he's walking in it. <laughs> he's walking in it. <laughs> Nobody's going to take it away from him. So here he is telling him it's him. And they're saying, you know, this imposter really has you convinced that he did something to you. <laughs> Tell us what he did. Tell us how he did it. Tell us what you did. And now the angels come to him and say, here's what you do with them. So the man looked at them and he said, well, this is really an astonishing thing. You are the leaders, the teachers of Israel, the guides of the church. And you don't know who he is? <laughs> what, what man ever did this kind of thing before? <laughs> You're saying he's a sinner? Does God do these kinds of things with sinners through sinners? <laughs> and they just, <laughs> he had him. He had him. And they looked at him. Oh, oh, you ignorant, ignorant, oh, you, <laughs> you were born all together in sin, and you're going to teach us? <laughs> oh. He had seen the Pharisees. He had seen his parents, and now they said, get out of here. <laughs> and now he runs across Jesus. And he looks into that face, and he knows there can't be another face like this one. Calm, <laughs> loving, benevolent, clear. He looks into that face. And Jesus says to him, do you believe in the Son of God? I said, well, who is he? <laughs> See, clear up to now, he doesn't know. <laughs> who is he? He says, the one that's talking to you and the one that you're looking at. <laughs> well, that's powerful, the one you see in front of you. <laughs> I said, yes, Lord, I believe. Oh, oh, the man was a Christian then. He'd received 
the light and he can see. Do you know what quieted down those Pharisees? The angels, through this man, communicated something from heaven that I hope we're getting by now. I'm going to read you the way John says it. It's a marvelous thing that you not from whence he is, and yet he has opened my eye. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him God hears. Did you catch that? The person who has the light and walks in it, the one that does the will of God, does the mighty works of God. The whole Christian world has missed that. They have grace only, just believe. The Bible doesn't teach that. And the Pharisees all knew it. <laughs> That's why they got quiet. They said, he just said the truth. <laughs> it seems we ought to know it too. He that doeth the will of God, him God hears. He now had the higher revelation. He has seen Jesus as the Son of God. It was revealed to his soul. And he took it. He surrendered himself to it. Now, when Jesus was talking to the group again, and they said, are we blind too? They knew Jesus was talking about the Pharisees and what they couldn't see. They said, are we blind too? And Jesus said, well, you say you see. You can't be blind if you see, can you? I said, wait a minute, what's he doing here? What Jesus was telling them was, God gave you eyes to see with. And if you can't see, it's not his fault. He has not made it impossible for you to understand truth. You're making a choice. And that choice means you're blind. You can't see spiritual things. And if you can't see the spiritual realities of God... Your sin remains because you can't see. You've chosen not to see. Now that to me is such an amazing thing because he goes over to the blind man and he makes him see. <laughs> so we know Jesus can do that. He took a physically blind person and made him see physically and at the same time made him see spiritually. And that man walked in the light for the rest of his time. And the light increases, increases, increases. I have a minute here. I'm going to try to get to a quote. I don't know if I can do it. This, there's so many things in this computer No, it looks like a ticket ad. Let me see. No, there it is. There it is. Fine print. I can't see in the fine print. Okay, here we go. Okay, God himself is the light of his people. Where am I here? Forty four fourteen. Having entered the school of Christ, 
The student is prepared to engage in the pursuit of knowledge without becoming dizzy from the height to which he's climbing. As he goes on from truth to truth, obtaining clearer and brighter views of the wonderful laws of science and of nature, he becomes enraptured with the amazing exhibitions of God's love to man. He sees with intelligent eyes the perfection, knowledge, and wisdom of God stretching beyond into infinity as his mind enlarges and expands. Pure streams of light pour into his soul. The more he drinks from the fountain of knowledge, the purer and happier his contemplation of God's infinity and the greater his longing for wisdom sufficient to comprehend the deep things of God. <laughs> That's in volume four of the testimonies. <laughs> That's for somebody who understands what the light is. The presence of Jesus expanding the mind. <laughs> That's what it says in Christ Object Lessons 147 that Jesus longs to take us over to where the veil is. And he pulls aside the veil. There's infinity. And then he reveals to us the infinity beyond. <laughs> this, we're just touching the edges of things. <laughs> God has something in mind for us where he really wants us to go. But we're not going to get there listening to somebody. We've got to get into those books and find these gems. I have seven pages here of little quotes on the light that I'm sure most of our people don't know. And that's just seven pages out of Acts of the Apostles and Christ's Object Lessons. There's a, another 65 books to go through. <laughs> one more. Maybe I have time for one more. Confrontation, page 35. Confrontation, page 35. Confrontation. It's a little, little red book. It's, it says, The halo of glory which God had given holy Adam to cover him as a garment departed from him after his transgression. The light of God's glory could not cover disobedience and sin. That's what those Pharisees knew. And the man silenced them with the concept. Jesus couldn't be in the wrong place with God and do the things he did. Now Jesus says, go, and he says, I send you in my place. You do the things that I have done. You do them now. <laughs> we can do what Jesus did, but we have to do the way he did. <laughs> but these are promises God has left us. You have abilities you don't know anything about. <laughs> You have powers you're not tapping into. We've got to believe God. Act as though your faith were invincible. <laughs> Father, we thank you. You're pulling us out of that darkness. The light that's in us is developing day by day. Help us to see, Lord, that though we do it in the plan of addition, that if we do it every day with you, you do it by multiplication. There's a geometric progression the way you do it. Help us, Lord, to keep walking forward even though we don't know where it's going. Nothing happened to the Hebrew nation until they got their feet wet. You said, go forward, and that big body of water was right there. Nothing happened until they stepped into it. Help us to live that way when you tell us something. Help us to start walking, and then you'll take care of it with us. Bless us as we hear your voice in Jesus' precious name.
Amen.